Well, good morning, church. We are so pleased to be able to gather safely from our homes to worship the Lord, to honor the Lord, and to love the Lord with our reverence. As we gather, there's um, a number of announcements I want to share with you, and, and some of them are some pretty big announcements. Um, last Sunday, we had our service Sunday, and we had all sorts of service going on around our city, everything from cleaning up um, a house of a social agency that needed some yard cleanup, to making masks, to making wreaths, to making some Love Lives Here hearts that you can hang on your door like this. Um, and we have these projects still available. We wanted to make sure we had enough for last Sunday, um, but we still want to get the rest of them out there. So if you would like to help with any of the projects that we have um, listed on the back page of the announcements, we can still do the door hangers with popcorns. We can still make masks. We can make the coin card for the open door mission, and we can make the Love Lives Here uh, hearts. So please um, consider serving the, the community that we are a part of and letting them know they are loved um, and cherished. Uh, in addition to that, we also have upcoming ice cream socials, uh, time for our community to gather together. We had two this past week, one after service Sunday and one last Wednesday. And we're gonna have another one this next Wednesday here at the church on our lawn. And then next Sunday after worship, we'll also have a social celebration as we celebrate Rally Sunday. Now, if you're listening carefully, you may have heard an implication there. After worship, we're going to have a social. So the session met last week, or actually this, this past Monday, and have decided to open up for outdoor worship. And we will have our regular worship time at 1030 in the morning. And we will still continue to provide worship in the same way we have been for the last 25 weeks of, of COVID-19. So if, if you are more comfortable at home watching and being a part of things on YouTube or Facebook Live, by all means, please continue to do so. It's very possible that we will um, only be streaming the service live to one of those platforms, probably Facebook, and then we will upload it um, to the other platform, probably YouTube, uh, later on in the, in the afternoon. But what we're going to be doing is a live worship service shared via um, Facebook Live and YouTube. So the same camera angles you're used to seeing are going to work, except the camera that you're looking at me on right now, it'll be outside because Pastor Jenny and I will be leading worship outside on the lawn. If you decide to come and join us for worship, we would love to have you, but there are a few um, kind of guidelines we need to follow. We all need to remain um, physically distant from the households that we live in. So households can gather together and then the next household should be six feet away. We need to be wearing masks. And if we do these things, and if we do things in the open air, we can get into a little bit of a semblance of normalcy for worship. We can sing if we want, if we're outdoors wearing masks and distance. Um, so we've looked at the safest way to begin stepping in to uh, worship, and we're very excited to offer that. So next Sunday at our regular worship time at 10.30 a.m., bring your own chair. Uh, we will have one bathroom unlocked and available over in Millard Hall in the education wing. Um, and we are asking anybody that uses it to use um, sanitizing wipes on the touch surfaces as they go in and as they go out. Um, but we do want to make that available as well. So we're just mainly asking everybody to, to kind of be wise about our gathering, to think about the other. And we look forward to the time when we start to return to normalcy, whenever that may be. But until that time, while it's still nice weather out, we can gather for worship outside um, if all things continue on the path we're seeing. So those of you that would like to join us, we really look forward to seeing you. Those of you that um, feel it's wiser to stay home, completely understood. There's no judgment either way, whether you come here or worship online. Uh, we're just looking forward to worshiping the Lord together in whatever our community looks like. With that, let's take some time to greet one another in the chat. Say hello. Uh, let us know you're with us with a thumbs up or a heart emoji um, or chat to each other about what you're most looking forward to, to that time when worship does go back to some form of in-person worship, whether it's outdoors or indoors here in the sanctuary. Uh, we love you. We're looking forward to seeing you. 
Let's say hello to one another. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you here in worship with us this morning. At this time, I invite you to join us in voice and spirit as we sing our first praise hymn this morning. This is Amazing Grace. together as we worship on this Sunday morning. And I invite you now to join with me in our call to worship. We gather this morning to learn and to grow, to know God and follow God's law. It is written, do not dishonor our parents, do not murder or covet, do not commit adultery or steal or bear false witness. All the things we are told not to do would be impossible to do if we love one another and love our neighbor as ourselves. It is the action of loving that we fulfill God's law. Let us worship God. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like what I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I am loved I am. When I've seen many 
searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. Friends, isn't that a beautiful reminder that we have a good Father who loves us, loves us for who we are, loves us for our shortcomings, and is quick to forgive us when we ask for forgiveness. And let us take a moment now to confess our wrongdoings, to come face to face with God and to ask for forgiveness as we pray our prayer of confession, followed by our own time of silent prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we often struggle to remember, interpret, and follow through with your commands. We make excuses or blame others when we find ourselves falling short of your expectations. Help us to see that with love on our minds, love in our hearts, and with love as our motivation, we cannot go wrong. Remind us that love will guide us to do what is right and what we are called to do. Guide us to realize that our sins are not attributed to someone else's behavior or mindset, nor are they the result of simply not knowing what you want from us. Your commands are clear and enough to keep us on the path of righteousness while living in your law, to love you above all others and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let us pray. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. And friends, hear the good news. The Lord knows that there are times we don't love each other or ourselves. He knows that we often blame others for being unreasonable or unloving. Yet he forgives us despite these same shortfalls. He treats us with love and asks that we do the same for others. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the 
the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to our children's message this morning. Now, today, if you've been paying attention, you've probably noticed two things already. One, I have a shovel, and it is September. And two, we've been talking a lot about neighbors this morning. Now, I love the teachings of Jesus because they're often so simple in contrast to other teachings of the time that were so specific and complicated. Jesus' teaching can often be boiled down to treat your neighbor as yourself. And I like that, but what does that mean? Well, for me, when I think about a neighbor, especially a good neighbor, I think about a family friend. Now, his name is Ron, and he works as a custodian at a school here in Omaha. Now, if you have lived any winter in Omaha, you know that one of the things we get a lot of in the winter is snow. So between shovels and snow blowers, they have to do a lot of work to get rid of all that. Now, not only does Ron, when it snows, have to go in really, really early to try and clean everything up to make sure it's safe for everyone, he takes some time and he goes across the street to someone who has nothing to do with the school. It's an elderly couple, and he makes sure that their stuff is shoveled too. Now, no one asked him to do this. He doesn't get paid to do this. He does it because he wants to be a good neighbor. He wants to make sure that those people are taken care of because they may not be able to do it themselves. And if they tried, he might be worried they'd hurt themselves. So friends, let's talk about what it means to be a good neighbor right now. Right now, being a good neighbor means maybe staying six feet away from people, which is farther than you may want to do right now. Being a good neighbor could be wearing a mask, These are really simple choices. But by doing that, we show that we care about each other, that we love one another, and we want our neighbors to be treated as ourselves. Because by doing that, all of us get to stay healthy and keep moving on with our lives. So I want you guys to think about what being a good neighbor means, how Maybe not shoveling someone's driveway, but maybe something as simple as putting on a mask and staying a little bit farther away can help everyone else. Friends, will you pray with me this morning? Lord God, thank you for this day that you have made for us. God, thank you for the simple advice, the simple motto that can be followed. Treat your neighbor as yourself. It is so easy to remember. And God, if we truly take that lesson to heart, and we truly treat our neighbor as ourselves, God, this will be an incredible, wonderful place to live in. Help us to remember that and to help us act on that wisdom every single day. And all God's children said, amen. Thank you for joining me this morning, friends. Hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, Today is a communion Sunday, 
And every time that we celebrate communion, we gather around the table of the Lord. We gather around recognizing that all are welcome at the table. One of my favorite things about my invitation to the table when I have the opportunity to give it is that it doesn't matter if you are a member of First Presbyterian Church of Omaha, it doesn't matter if you're a Presbyterian, it doesn't matter if you're in the United States, it is your faith that matters, for it is faith in Jesus Christ that opens the table to us all. Even though, according to the law, the statutes and requirements of the Old Testament, we could never even bear to approach that table for we are so unworthy. We recognize every time we come to a communion Sunday and and ideally every time we worship that Christ did so much to bring those who are undeserving, us, to gather around the table for the feast of the Lord and the feast of eternal life. As we go through life, we ask ourselves, what does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to be a Christian and what does it mean to live by the law? And the quick answer is that we simply can't live by the law on our own. We would completely and utterly fail if you read through the Old Testament laws and books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and other books that have requirements, we cannot do it ourselves. Over and over we would fail. Either there's a purity law and we come in contact with something impure in some way, shape, or form, and then you have to quarantine yourself for a period of time, very similar to what we deal with right now in 2020. Or there's a work law and laboring at the wrong times. And if there's a work law, then you have to wonder how does work get done in the right time? And so a law is often violated on your behalf. Or there's a clothing law of wearing mixed threaded clothing. Or there's this law or that law. And the law is so precise and so difficult that we just cannot do it on our own. And so we make sacrifices, if you follow Old Testament laws, you make sacrifices depending on the severity of your failure. A bird here, a heifer there. You do what you need to do to make it right with God, and the priest says, you're good to go, and the minute you walk out the door almost, you failed again. It's a cycle that happens over and over and over again when you look at how to live according to the Old Testament laws. It just can't be done. The faith of the Old Testament was literally about making sacrifices for what you've done and then going and doing it over and over again. A hopeless cycle until a Messiah would come. And we believe that that has happened. We believe that Jesus came and said, let's talk about the law. Let's talk about all these rules and let's summarize the law into two of the greatest commandments, to love God and to love your neighbor. Essentially what Jesus was saying was be reverent and be kind. That's it. That's the summary of the two greatest commandments. How hard could that be? Well, reverence, we, we get reverence. We understand that. We, we worship. We study God to know him better, to worship him more. And we serve in his name. And we do this as a community of faith. That's part of that service Sunday, last Sunday, was our community worshiping God through our acts across the city. Reverence we get. We may not perfectly fulfill it all the time, but we get it. We can wrap our head around what it means to worship God. And for many of us, worshiping God means gathering at 1030 remotely right now, next week on our lawn if you want, but gathering to worship God for one hour on Sunday. But reverence is more than that. Reverence is living your life as a life of reverence to the Lord seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And we do that by loving our neighbor. 
how do we incorporate loving our neighbor? I think to do this, we must always look at that second greatest commandment, that in order to worship God and to love God, we have to love our neighbor as well because that's the sign of our love for God is reflecting the love we've received to the world. So how do we love our neighbor? Let's just look at the environment that we live in in 2020 right now. Loving your neighbor is like AJ said, wearing a mask, staying six feet distant, even if we don't want to, even if we don't like it, it's keeping our neighbor safe. That's one way. But we also should look at just who our neighbor is. And we don't like this answer of who our neighbor is because our neighbor isn't the neighbor down the street that looks just like us and works like us and does all sorts of their activities just like us. That is a neighbor, but neighbors are not limited to that type of neighbor. Our neighbor isn't even the person that we wouldn't want down the street because they have loud parties or they don't mow their lawn or they do this wrong or they have a junked car in their driveway. That is our neighbor, but it's not limited to just that. Our neighbor is more than just the people we know, the people who live right down the street, whether we like them or not. Our neighbor is all of humanity. Your neighbor is black, brown, white, or anything else on the color spectrum. Your neighbor is a cop. Your neighbor is a criminal or anything else in between, sometimes missing the mark. Your neighbor is a Republican. Your neighbor is a Democrat. Your neighbor is some other version of political alliance. Your neighbor is a Christian. Your neighbor is a Muslim or anything else of any other type of faith. To love your neighbor is to love the human beyond the classifications that we put on that human. Race, color, creed, gender, sexuality, anything else, those are our classifications. God's classification, that's your neighbor. How do we love our neighbor is that we love the person we encounter no matter what preconceived notions we have about them, recognizing we all have preconceived notions. They're ingrained into who we are. It's good to know what those are so that we can respond appropriately as we encounter thoughts in our heads. But our neighbor is the next person we encounter. Because we believe that Christ came and died for all people. There are no qualifiers. There is no red Christ or blue Christ. No Republican Christ or Democrat Christ. No Christ just for the criminal. No Christ just for the law enforcement person. No Christ for the oppressed only and no Christ only for the oppressor. No Christ for pro-choice. No Christ only for pro-life people. It is Christ for all who place their faith in him. Now that's a tough concept because each and every one of us has very deeply ingrained thoughts about what it means to be a Christian and what any of these issues mean as far as how you think and whether you can be Christian or not, but the reality is faith in Jesus Christ saves all. How we act on that faith, that's what we put on it, and we have to reconcile in our own heads if our actions in our faith are biblically sound. And every different argument can be made on every different end of every spectrum of any of these things I just mentioned. But every Christian can justify their actions through Scripture in their own minds. To God, through Jesus Christ, it is faith that saves us. And if we are called to reflect the love of God we've received through Jesus Christ to the world, we believe that faith has saved them too. Our job is to share that faith. Our job is to be Christ to the world when he's not here. Our job is to love and share. Now, our sense of justice rejects this notion. How could Christ be for them, for those people who aren't of my same political thought, who aren't of my same 
Facebook discussion group that reaffirms each other's thoughts, who are different from what I think. How could Christ be for those people? But we need to hold a mirror up first before we look outside of our own lives because Christ is for us, for each and every one of us, just as Christ is for those people that we think are wrong because they're sinning, Christ is for each of us, a sinner who cannot save themselves. We must look at ourselves because the minute we hold up God's law to see how others fulfill or fail to fulfill it, we cannot help but notice that the hand holding that law that we're looking at is our own and we are bound to it as well. And we fail all the time. Have I loved others as I love myself? Sometimes, perhaps, especially if I like them. But every time, no way. Have I always put others first? Sometimes, perhaps, if I've met them before, if I like them, if I've encountered them, if I can trust them. But every time, no way. Have I always put God first? Sometimes, if I don't have something else going on Sunday morning that seems important, if I don't have something else going on with this Bible study that I feel called to, so I don't join that, if I don't have something else going on when it's time to do service in the name of the church, sometimes, but every time, no. But Christ came and died for all, including us, all the time. Sometimes we fail, but all the times Jesus Christ saves. What a joy. What pleasure we can take in knowing we have a Savior who loves us and died for us. He died for the Jews who followed him and declared him as Lord. He died for the woman at the well, a woman and a Samaritan. He died for the Roman centurion part of an occupying, oppressing force in Jerusalem. He died for the ones that condemned him. He died for the ones who beat him. He died for the ones who denied him. And he died for you and he died for me. Thanks be to God. And as a result of that, we love our neighbor. And if we ask ourselves, how do we love our neighbor? I think it all comes down to how we choose to interact with each other, how we choose to love the other, how we chose to be as we are in the world as Christ's people. We make choices every moment of our lives about how we display the love of God that we have received through Jesus Christ, about how we share that love with the world. Some choices are easy. They're no-brainers. Some choices are very difficult, and we struggle with the right thing to do. Some may not even seem like choices at the time. But in all we do, we are all called, and we must be constantly thinking about reflecting God's love that he has shown to us, to the world that they may know it that all may gather at the table of the Lord and partake in Christ's broken body and his shed blood that brought about the forgiveness of sins for all of us. We have choices to make in how we live. What choices do you make going forward? Amen.
Friends, let us take a moment as we affirm our faith together through the Apostles' Creed, something that has been written long ago, that those that became before us have confessed and those that will come long after us have confessed as well. So let us lift our voices together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, as we continue in worship, I invite you to join with me now as we pray, knowing that there are requests that each of us have, and we bring them to the Lord, knowing that even if we don't know how to put them into words, God hears our prayers. Will you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for this occasion where we have the capabilities to come together to worship across, across miles, uh, wherever we are, God, in this moment, we praise you and thank you. On this day, we are mindful, God, of those who have suffered great loss. And we think about the Eric Schumacher family and the loss that he that they have suffered with his passing. We also continue prayers for the Boyd family and the death of Doug. Ask that you just comfort these people that have suffered great loss. Comfort them in this moment. Surround them with your loving arms. Surround them with neighbors who care for them and love them. God, we are mindful also of those who have suffered loss in the fires and in the hurricanes that have been ravaging the country. Pray for those that have lost life. Pray for those that have lost everything. God, in a nation that seems to continually be on upheaval, on pins and needles, on edge, God, we pray for peace. We pray that you help us to be instruments of peace, that we can see how we can be a neighbor, a neighbor to someone who looks different from us, who thinks different from us. Help us to be that neighbor, to love them with your love. God, that we may be your hands and feet in a hurting world that we may bring peace, that we may bring love. God, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we worship here today, we have the opportunity to give back to God a portion of what God has given to us. Scripture tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. And it is that thought in mind as we come to this moment in our worship that ask you to examine your heart, to know all the blessings that God has given us, and to think about the ways that we can give them back. There's a number of ways that you can give, and they're on your screen now. I invite you to give with a cheerful heart.
Will you pray with me? Generous and loving God, we thank you for the gifts that you give us, for the blessings that we receive daily. God, we ask that you help us to be faithful stewards of all things, and that these gifts that we give today, that they may be multiplied and generously given, spread throughout the world as we, our neighbors, loving one another, sharing your love around the world. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, we gather at the supper table, but not just a table like any table in our kitchen, for this is the Lord's table that has room for an unlimited amount of seats. There is no restriction to this table short of the one that we place our faith in Jesus Christ. You are invited to partake in the gift of the Lord to us as we remember his sacrifice. As I said in my sermon, it doesn't matter if you're a member of this church. It doesn't matter if you're a Presbyterian. All that matters is that declaration of, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And you are at the table. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks to heaven above, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which I have given for you. And in the same way that he took the bread, he also took the cup. And as he poured it out, he said, This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. This is the bounty of the Lord for the people of God. Take and eat and drink.
And friends, as often as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we remember Christ's promise that he will come again. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, thank you for coming to us in Jesus Christ. Renew in us faith and hope that we may welcome Christ to, do, to rule our thoughts and claim our love as Lord of lords and King of kings through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. strength when I am weak. You are my treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, receive the benediction, my friends. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion in, with, and of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined at heart and home.